Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. All right, if we could at this time, can we welcome our D-Side campus there? Join us right now for our message. Welcome, D-Side. We are so excited to have you here. They're down in Jamaica. Yaman, we're glad to have you. What going? That's the only patois I know. That's for Pastor Richard. What guan, it means what's going on or how are you doing. And I can't remember how you guys are supposed to respond to me. So welcome down there in Jamaica. And Jamaica, I just want to let you guys know how honored we are to have Richard as part of our team. He is an incredible man of God. And we're just grateful for all the work that he's doing down there in Jamaica. And so we're thankful that you're with us, Pastor Richard. Thank you for you and your family and what's going on down in Jamaica. We also have with us, um, joining us from all over the country, all over over the world. We have people on our iCampus, and so thank you for joining us. If you're on our iCampus right now, we are so excited that you're here with us. I uh, hope you are encouraged today by what we do. Uh, we are in a series called E-Files, and it's where we have been walking through the book of Ephesians, and that video had absolutely nothing to do with the message today. I just needed a chance to catch my breath, a chance to sit down a little bit and, and, and get, get ready for a, a different phase of the, of the day. So anyway, I hope you had fun with that at least. At least you can walk away and you have a joke to say and talk about slapping your mama. So how about that? Uh, there you go. So we're in our series called E-Files, and we've just been walking through the book of Ephesians, and we're about halfway through, just over halfway through the book of Ephesians. And it's been a great time. I've really enjoyed our time together as we've been doing that. And I get the opportunity this week and, and next week to, to preach the two messages that are part of this series. And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. And what I want you to know as we get into this is that the first few chapters of Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, Paul is writing and he's kind of describing a little bit about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. So if you go back and read that, if you remember our past series, 1 through 3 is, is that, who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But as we get into chapters 4, 5, and 6, what we're going to see is how do we live or how do we walk in light of these truths about Jesus? So we're getting into the section of our series where I believe is going to be probably the most practical for us. He's going to begin to tell us certain things, certain ways that we need to live, certain things we need to be careful of, certain things that we need to be doing in light of what we know about Jesus. So it's going to be a great time. We're just going to jump right into it. And, and my goal, my desire when I get an opportunity to do this, to, to present the word, to preach, is just to encourage you and challenge you. I believe that, that someone here today, someone listening at any one of our locations, someone on the iCampus, you, you need a little bit of encouragement today. And, and, but I also believe that if you come to church and you walk out of church and, and you weren't challenged or you weren't provoked to change something, you weren't challenged to do something different, you weren't challenged to apply what you learned, then, then you missed out. So my desire is that today that every single one of us would walk out of our location or, or click off our computer on the iCampus and be challenged to apply what we learn here in Ephesians 4. So if you would, open up your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4 or just look up on our screens or if you're online, we'll probably be scrolling it across the bottom of my face here right now. We're going to begin and we're just going to break down Ephesians 4, chapter 4, verse 17 through 24. We're just going to kind of break it apart here. So here's Paul. He begins with this. Ephesians 4, verse 17 says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. Paul begins this section of scripture and he says, hey, I want to be clear that you understand that this isn't something that I just made up. This isn't something that comes from me. I want you to know that this is based on God's authority. This comes from God. It's pretty self-explanatory. Then he goes on to say, you need to live no longer as the Gentiles do. So if we break that apart, we understand that these people who he's talking to once lived like Gentiles. Are you following me? Are you following me? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, I, like, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I like to interact just a little bit, so I need to know that you understand me, because sometimes I talk fast and sometimes I use words that aren't really words, so I need to make sure you're understanding what's going on. Are you following me now? 
Okay, woo! This is gonna be good. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, I gotta move the chair. I can't sit anymore because it's gonna get good. You guys are ready and I'm ready. He says you need to quit living like the Gentiles. So we need to understand they used to live this way, but he's telling them you need to quit living this way. And we need to say, well, with Gentiles, what, what does he mean by the Gentiles? Well, when Paul refers to the Gentiles, he's talking about people, people that don't believe in God, that don't know God, that don't obey God, and that don't follow God. Okay, the Gentiles were a group of people that, that didn't believe in God, didn't know God, didn't love God, and didn't follow God. So what he's talking here and what he's telling us is that you need to quit living like someone who doesn't believe in God, someone who doesn't know God. And he's saying you need to live no longer. I like the way he says it here. And there's a, another translation, the ESV translation, that says you need to walk no longer like the Gentiles do. What he's saying is you used to walk in this way. You used to walk like someone who didn't believe in God. You used to behave in such a way that God wasn't really on your mind, that you didn't follow his truths, you didn't love God, you didn't know God, and you used to walk this way. But he says you need to quit doing that. See, because when you're walking as a Gentile, when you're walking like someone who doesn't know God, you're walking further and further away from God, but you're also walking closer to sin and destruction and dissatisfaction. He's saying when you're walking this way, you're actually going further and further away from God. And so he says you need to stop walking in this manner. And then what he's going to do here is he's going to describe a Gentile. He's going to describe someone that doesn't know God, love God, believe in God, or follow God. Here's who he's about to start describing. If you're in the room today and you've accepted Christ, you have a relationship with Jesus, you would call yourself a Christian, he's about to describe the old you. It doesn't matter if you got saved when you were four and that was 40 years ago. It doesn't matter if you got saved 10 days ago or 10 minutes ago. He's about to describe who you once were before Christ, the old you. But if you are listening to this message and, and you would say, well, I'm, I'm, I don't really believe in God. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Then he's about to describe you, the you as you are right now. And what he's about to say is if, if you are in that category, it's, it, it's not the most encouraging word from Paul he's ever given. He's about to describe you and say some things that are a little discouraging, discouraging that um, aren't exactly peppy, okay? But I want you to hold on because sometimes you have to speak about some bad stuff before you can get to the good stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you got you to gotta talk about the bad before you can get to the good, and we're going to get to some really good stuff here. But we got we to gotta hit on this for just a second. So Paul begins to describe the old you or the you if you don't believe in God right now and you're listening to this. Here's what he says about you or the old you. Ephesians 4, he continues and said, for they are hopelessly confused their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Okay. Thank you, Paul, for that encouraging word this morning. Appreciate that. See, he begins to say, he, he starts out with this phrase. He says, they're hopelessly confused. If you don't believe in God today, if you're not following God, if you don't know God, you, you are without hope. You need to understand that today, that, that if, if you do not believe in God or the former you before Christ came into your life, there is no hope without Christ. I, I've seen this on a t-shirt um, actually by someone that, that comes to our church, a teenager. She had a shirt that looks very similar to this, and it reminded me of this passage. It says this, that if you don't, let's throw this picture up there. It says, no Christ, N-O, no hope. No Christ, no hope. Without Christ, there is no hope. There's no hope for this world that we live in right now, and there's no hope for the life that comes after death. Christ said, I came, and he is the only way, the truth, and the light. He's the only way to get to heaven. So without him, there's no hope for eternity. There's no hope for this world we live in. It's obvious that we live in a sin-cursed world. There is obviously some things going on in our world, in our country, in our society that points to the fact that there is some hopelessness. There is some problems. And if you don't believe in God, you're looking at this world and, and there is no hope in this world. Because without Christ, there is no hope. But this t-shirt that I saw, it was really cool. It threw up these letters in a different color and it looks like this. K. 
K-N-O-W. If you know Christ, you know hope. You see, without Christ, it's hopeless. But when Christ comes onto the scene, Christ brings hope, Christ brings peace, Christ brings goodness, Christ brings love. You see, without Christ, there is no hope, but with Christ, we can know hope. If you know him today, you know hope. You may see the things of this world, but you know that God says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day Christ will make all things new. And so you can have hope. But he's describing people that don't know God, so they are without hope. The next thing he says about them, he says, they're hopelessly, what's that word? Oh, I'm sorry, what's that word? Oh, okay, my writing's really small, small so I want to make sure you guys was reading the same thing. Yeah, hopelessly confused. And I just want to take a moment right now that if you are listening wherever you're at right now and you don't believe in God and you're struggling with that because you're like, I don't believe in God. I'm not really sure he's even real. I'm not really sure about this whole God thing. I just, I just happen to come to church or I'm happy to check you out. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. And, and I want you to know that you're welcomed here at the Rescue Church. We're so glad that you're here with us today. But I just want to talk to you for a second on why I believe that you may be confused. You see, I think there's a struggle going on inside of, of anyone that doesn't believe in God. Because deep down inside of every single one of us, there's something deep within us that tells us that there must be a God, that there needs to be a creator, that there must be a, a, a purpose to this life, that there's got to be a life after death, that there's got to be a greater purpose. There must be a, a morality, a, something that's really right and something that's really wrong. Deep down inside of every one of us, there's something that's telling us God exists. But if you don't believe in God, you see, I, I really think that the majority of people that struggle with a belief in God, the majority of people that don't believe in God, don't believe in him because of, of this problem that, called the problem of evil. I truly, sincerely think that for the majority of people that, that would stay up, stand in front of you and say, I don't, I don't believe in that God thing. I, I don't know about God's existence. The biggest struggle they have is the problem of evil. Because deep down inside of them, there, there's something that tells them God must exist. But something has occurred in their life, a pain, a, a sadness, a sorrow. Something has happened to someone they love. Something has happened directly to them that was just downright wrong. And you might be listening today, and, and you're, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, like God's supposedly this all-loving and all-good and all-knowing God, yet this evil thing has happened to a friend of mine or a family member of mine or, or to me, and, and how do I reconcile the two? How can God exist, and yet this thing has happened in my life? And I believe that that is, that is one of the biggest hindrances or roadblocks that someone has that doesn't believe in God because trying to reconcile a good, loving, all-knowing, great, powerful God and this evil that has occurred in their life is a difficult thing to do. And so what you would call a struggle because there's that, that thing inside you that says he's got to exist, but then there's this thing that's telling you that he doesn't exist. What you would call a struggle, I, I believe, is, is, is a confusion. And I want you to know that it is okay to struggle and wrestle with that. I think it's okay that right now you're like, God exists, uh, maybe he doesn't. I think it's okay that you're struggling with that because in just a second, Paul's about to tell us what happens to many people when they quit fighting, when they quit asking questions, when they quit trying to figure out if God really does exist. He's about to tell us what occurs. And I want you to know if you're here right now and you're struggling with that, you don't believe in God, but you're struggling with the questions of God, I want you to know this is the place for you. Ask your questions. Hopefully, if you stick around with us long enough, we'll answer some of those questions for you without you even trying to ask. But this is a safe place for you to be. This is a good place for you to be. But let's keep going and see what Paul says happens. He says, as, as you keep going, he says, Ephesians 4.18 says, they wander. <laughs> I got to take a break here. This is for my wife. See, I say they wonder. It's spelled W-A-N. That means wander. Okay, I don't know if you guys know that, but it means wander. And when I say wander, I sound really weird, Right? You can all shake your head in agreement, right? So they wander far from the life God gives. I, when I say the word wonder, W-O, and wander, they sound exactly the same to me. So if you hear me as we continue, I'm going to say this phrase like 10 times. When you hear me say they wandered far from the life God gives, I really mean wander, okay? <laughs> you following? 
All right. That's just, my wife's like, you, gotta, you can't get up there and say wander. I'm like, I don't know how to say wander. So we're going to say wander, and you guys, you guys know what I'm saying now. Right? We just had to, I told you, words that aren't really words, you got to, now we're here. All right. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their mind and hardened their hearts against him. We're going to skip over the first part because it says they wander. Man, that drives me crazy. They wander far from the life God gives, and it says because. Here's why people are wandering farther away from God. Because they've closed their mind and hardened their hearts. Here's what happens to people that don't believe in God, that are struggling. At one point, they're wrestling with that. They're asking questions. At some point, they begin to turn off their mind. They begin to close their mind to the things of God. They begin to stop. They begin to stop. That doesn't make sense. They stop asking questions about God. They begin to turn their mind off and close their mind to those questions and that struggle. And what that does is that thing inside, they begin to harden that heart. Another translation says their hearts become calloused. And a callous, those of you that play an instrument or, or are manly or even womanly and work with your hands, you know that a callous is something that comes from prolonged pressure on a single point. That sounds cool, doesn't it? Prolonged pressure on a single point produces a callous. And that's what happens to people's heart when they continue to live in such a way that in, in sin, when they continue to live in such a way that goes against what God has to do, and they continue to do it over and over and over again. And that sin that used to, you used to feel guilty about, like the first time, now, now the second time it got a little easier, right? The third time, even more easier. And all of a sudden, it's just part of who you are. Your heart's become callous to that. And the questions you used to have about God were, were part of you used to think, yeah, he, he must exist. You've, you've closed your mind off to the things of God, and now your heart's just, just starting to slowly harden, and, and you're not really struggling with it anymore. And you're walking down that path towards sin, away from God, and you got other people around you that believe the same thing, and so you're just bouncing ideas off each other, and you're like, are you sure there's no God? And they're like, man, there ain't no God. And, and you're, both of you are heading in the same direction with closed minds and hard hearts, and you're wandering further and further away from God. Paul says that they begin to wander because of their closed mind and the hard hearts. And I just want to say this. I, I think the first part that he talks about, the wandering, that was good is important. It says they wander far from the life that God, what? Gives. If you're here today, I want you to understand this, that God has a plan and a purpose and a vision for your life. God has a life, a life that he wants to give you, and I want you to hear this. God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life, period. God's plan for my life is better than my plan for my life. God has a purpose, has a vision, has something that he wants from me, and he wants to give me this life. And if you're wandering further and further away from God, you're not getting closer to the life that he wants for you. And God has a plan and a purpose for your life today, and it's better than the one you can do on your own. It's better than the one you can think of on your own. God has a plan for you. John 10.10 10 says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Another translation says to the, to the full. They may have it to the fullest. Jesus came to give you the greatest life possible. I'm not saying the happiest life. I'm not saying you're not going to have any trials or troubles and God wants you to be rich and healthy. That's not what I'm saying. But he does want the greatest life for you. And without Christ, apart from Christ, there's no hope. And you may have a good life. Maybe you have a good job, a, a good family, a good relationships, make good money. But you will never have the greatest life without Christ. Period. God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life. Fun for the camera there. All right. This is my favorite part of the whole thing. And we're just going to zip right through at this point. This is the best part is yet to come. I told you we had to start with some bad things. Now we're getting to some good things. Here's what the next line in this verse says. What does this next line say? I want you to read the first word. Just stop there. Shout it. All right. How many times have you said that in church before, huh? That's just weird. This is the greatest thing of the entire verse. When you see this word in scripture, you need to make sure that you fully understand what came right before it, Right? But you need to know that you need to pay attention to what's coming next, correct? You need to understand what happened before, but you need to know what comes next. All of a sudden, Paul goes, but. 
Jesus. Here's what he says. He says, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. When Jesus steps into the scene, when Jesus comes on to the picture, Jesus makes everything better. He says, that's not what you learned about Christ. He tells us we need to quit walking like the Gentiles do, describes what someone that doesn't love God, what doesn't believe in God looks like, and then he says, that's not what you guys have learned about Christ. What have you learned about Christ? You know, here's what you know about Christ, that he came for you, that he died for you, and that he rose again for you. He rose again for you. He did that for me. He did that for everyone. John 3, 16 said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that what? Whosoever or whoever. That means all the good people and all the bad people. That means all the old people and all the young people. That means all the people that you like and all the people that you don't strongly like. God came and he died for them and he rose again for them. He did it for the whole world. He did it for the whosoever. And he did that for you. And I want you to understand that when Jesus stepped onto the scene, he improved everything. He did all that for you. Another verse tells us that even while we were sinning, Christ came and he died for us. Even at our worst, God gave his best in his son Jesus. Even at our worst, God gave us his best best. This is what we know about Jesus. This is what we have learned about Jesus. He came, he died, and he rose again to give you hope, to give you an eternal life. And if you've accepted that, if you've begun a relationship with Jesus, when that happens, here's what Paul says should happen next. It says, now that you know about Jesus, this is what you learned about Christ, now you need to pay attention to this part. Here's what comes after that. Ephesians 4.22, it says that you need to throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. All right, uh, raise your hand for me for a second. How many of you got out of bed this morning? All right, a few of you. Good, that's great. All right, some of you got out of bed this morning. Most of us go through a, a very similar routine in the mornings, right? We, we get up, uh, well, most of us hit our snooze at least once or seven times, and, and we then get out of bed, right? And then we begin to take off our pajamas, or I like to call mine PJs. It's short, it's hip. The kids are saying it now. Take off your PJs. For me, that requires the unzipping of my footing pajamas. It goes all the way down. Slide those bad boys off, take them off. I throw them in the dirty clothes. I, th I throw them like on the ground, and they make it to the dirty clothes because I have a, a wonderful wife. So I, I take my pajamas off and I toss them over at least near the basket, right? And then after that, you begin to, to ch adjust your mind. You're not, you shouldn't be thinking about sleep anymore. Now you're starting to think, okay, it's time to get up. It's time to go. It's time to get ready. And, and, and you begin to put on new clothes, Right? You begin to put on a new outfit, new clothes that represent something. They, they normally represent either you're going to work that day or you're going to school that day or you're going to sit around in your yoga pants all day. Whatever that represents for you, it's, it's a change of clothes. You, you throw off your old. You begin to adjust your mind so you're thinking about what's to come and, and what I'm going to do today. And you begin to put on your new clothes. And I did that this morning. My assumption is that most of you did that as well. And Paul's about to describe that as well as a metaphor in our life. We're going to use that taking off, you know, that, that's something we do physically, that we do every single day, where we take off our pajamas and put on our new clothes. We're going to use that to help us understand what Paul says should happen when you know Christ, when you believe in Christ, when you accept Christ. He says you need to throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. He's saying, remember the walking thing he started out with. He says, you used to walk down this path that led to, dis to sin and destruction away from God. But then at some point, you accepted Christ. At some point, Christ stepped into your life. You accepted that free gift that he gives. And he said, you can no longer live or walk in the same way that you once lived or walked. He says, your old sinful nature, your former way of living, 
your former way of walking, you can't continue down the same path you did before you knew Christ. You have to throw off the old. You need to throw off the old you. The old me needs to be thrown. I don't just take my pajamas off and, and leave the zipper thing right down here on my footy pajamas and then just walk around the rest of the day like this. You know, I, I don't keep my zipper footy pajamas on and, and put on my, my plaid shirt over it. That doesn't make sense. You don't hold on to part of your pajamas. That's weird. You throw it off. Okay? You, if you're cool, you try to do some, you know, like alley-oops or something into the, the, the laundry basket. You, you throw off the old. And I want to say this. I think so many people, um, when it comes to the, the, the throwing off, so many people forget that we, we, most Christians, we understand that Christ forgave us of our sin and our past. We get that part. We, we seem to leave out and sometimes in our own mind forget that he set us free from it. Christ didn't just forgive you for all the bad things you did in your former way of living. He set you free from it. He wants you to throw it off. He wants you to live and walk down a new path that's going closer to God, that's, that's away from that. He wants you to throw off your old. And that this is the most important part of the whole piece of Scripture, I believe. It's something that, that I um, am constantly trying to do and, and trying to work into my own life. Here's what Ephesians 4.23 says. It says, instead, let the Spirit... Renew your thoughts and attitude. Let the who? Spirit. spirit renew your thoughts and attitude. It says you need to let the Spirit of God change the way you think and the way you act. You need to ask God to give you His eyes. You need to ask God to give you the love that He has for people. You need to ask God to have the Spirit move within you so that you begin to see people the way God sees people. You begin to love people the way God loves people. You begin to see what used to bother you in someone else's life, and now you see it as an opportunity for you to serve them. You see, when you let the Spirit change your thoughts and your attitudes, you begin to become more like Christ. And, and I heard this, and I think it's so true. It's so good. You can change what you do. Only Christ can change who you are. But when Christ changes who you are, it changes what you do. Let me say it one more time. I'm going to start back where I started so you can get the picture again. You can change what you do. Say it with me. You can change what you do. But only Christ can change who you are. But if he changes who you are, it changes what you do. We need to say it one more time. This is fun. All right. You can change what you do, but only Christ can change who you are. But when Christ changes who you are, it changes what you do. You guys got this. The key to that verse, the key to that section is let the Spirit do it. The Christian life Following Jesus isn't about you trying to stop all your bad. It isn't about you at all. It's about Jesus. He saved you. He set you free. He's going to do the work within you to make you more and more like himself. You say, well, I, just, I try really hard not to, to walk the way I used to. I try really hard not to be the person I once did. No, no, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. And then we, we wrap it all up with this. Ephesians 4.24 says, And then you put on the, your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and truly holy. When the Spirit begins to change your thoughts and your attitudes, you begin to put on that new nature, you start becoming more and more like God. And just like I said earlier, that God has a plan and a purpose and a vision for your life that's greater than your own plan for your life, God's plan and vision and purpose for your life is that you would become more and more like him. God's desire, the way he's designed it, is that every single day you would walk in a way that brings you closer to God. You would walk down a path that brings you closer to God. How do you live? How do you walk? How do you know 
that you're walking closer to God? How do you know that you're becoming more like God? Well, you probably need to get yourself one of these things. It's called a Bible. John said this, and Pastor John has said this before, that, that the Bible is God's number one way of communicating his will or his plan for your life. This is God's number one way of communicating to you, is the Bible. And so how do you know if you're becoming more like Christ? Well, you probably should read about God and his character and who he was, and you should probably should read about what Christ did, and you probably should understand how Christ treated people. And if you're not treating people and living and acting like God did, then you're probably not behaving more like Christ. You're probably not understanding that new nature. You need to see and understand and read about God so that you can become more and more like him. And I say this again, I want to emphasize that it's the spirit that changes you. But you need to understand, you be able to look and see where you're heading. You'll be able to see God's word and say, oh, okay, that makes sense. I used to just dislike being around people, but you know, I think God wants me to love on people. I used to look at a situation when I'd go to work and say, oh man, I got to serve someone else today. But no, Christ said that he came to serve, not to be served. So serving is, is an attribute of, of God, serving and loving people and, and taking care of people. That, that's something that, that is after God's own heart. So if, if you are putting on your new nature, you're created to be like God. And that leads to true righteousness and true holiness. We need to be putting on the new me. And so I told you I want to challenge you. My, my goal is that this has been somewhat encouraging for you. And I want to challenge you with, with, with something here today. If, if you're here today in that first part of our scripture where we describe someone that doesn't believe in God, if, if that fits you, if you're listening somewhere online or at one of our locations and that fits you, I want you to know that, that I, I hope that you're struggling inside. I hope that you're questioning the things of God. I hope that you're asking questions. You say, I don't believe in God, but, but there's something deep inside of me that tells me he's got to be real. I, I just pray that you would, you, would, you would work that through, that you would keep asking questions. But if you're a Christian and, and, and you've accepted Christ, then, then my, my challenge for you is this. It's simple. Every single day, you're going to, well, hopefully, every single day, you're going to get out of bed and you're going to take off your PJs. Now, you may not have sweet zipper pajamas. You may not even call them PJs. To be honest with you guys, my PJs, um, like, they're not ex non-existent, uh, if that makes any sense. And you can follow that line of reasoning on your own. So, so I don't exactly have the same routine. I don't really take a whole lot off to put on my clothes. If you, you following me now? Okay, so my PJs are different than most people's PJs. But when you take that off, here's what I want to challenge you to do. As you, as you take off your, your sleeping outfit, let's just call it that. I want you to think about Ephesians 4. I want you to apply the metaphor right then and there. So you're taking it off, and you're thinking, all right, today I'm going to put away some of that former way of living. And then as you begin to put on your new outfit for whatever you have to do that day, I want you to think about the Spirit renewing your thoughts and attitude. I want you to just take a moment and say, okay, God, today you know what I have to do. I'm just asking that my thoughts and my attitudes and my actions would become more like you today. Can you give me your love for people as I go to work today? Can you help me treat people the way you want me to treat them as I go to work today? Can you renew my mind today? And so as you put on your new clothes, I, just, I want to challenge you to do this. I, I want you to, every day as you begin to do that, that you would just, over and over, daily, you begin to just start your day off by saying, God, would you help me become more like you today? God, would you renew my thoughts and my attitude so that I'm more like you? It's a simple challenge, but I believe if every day you're applying Ephesians 4 to your life, I believe what it will cause is that new nature where you're, you're becoming more and more like Christ, which I truly believe is God's plan and vision for your life, that you would become more and more like him on a daily basis. So if you guys, we're just gonna close with a word of prayer. This is bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much for, for your word. Thank you for Paul and, and his, his writing. Thank you for what we can learn from it. And Lord, my simple prayer over the people that, that, that can hear me today is that you would change who they are. My simple prayer is that they would allow you, that they would it let you 
Let the Spirit of God renew their thoughts and their attitudes so that they can become more like you. And so I pray that, that everyone listening today would, would, would take that simple, silly challenge as they get up every morning and they take off the old and they put on their new outfit and they begin to get ready for the day, that they would, they would begin to let you, the Spirit of God, change who they are. Would you help them remember Ephesians 4 today? God, thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us. Thank you so much for your son and sending him and giving your very best, even at our worst. We love Jesus, and it's in your name we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from The Rescue Church. You can listen to more past messages at therescuechurch.com. If you'd like to share how God spoke to you through this message, we'd love to hear from you. Just send your stories to therescuechurch at hotmail.com. If this message has blessed you, you can support the ministry of The Rescue Church by giving online at our website under the Donate tab.